In July 2015, a mother would commit an absolutely unthinkable crime. She would kill both her own father and her own daughter. And why? Because essentially her daughter was getting in the way of her own love life. This is what happens when ego and selfish needs overtakes the very nurture that a mother is expected to offer the child that she's brought into this world. This is the killing of Meredith Jesse. guys how you all doing thank you for joining me today for those of you who are new to this channel i release my content on a wednesday and a sunday it's always crime related it's always deep dive so if you like a bit of crime and consistency in your life this is definitely the channel for you thanks to everyone supporting me on youtube membership and on patreon cannot do this without you this is one of those cases that i've wanted to cover and i've actually watched the entire four hour plus interrogation because it's not just about doing the research. When you get the opportunity to actually look directly into the lives of an individual who is actually being interviewed for murders that consequently they admit to, it gives you an extra addition. Obviously in the UK, we don't really have interrogations that optional. So when I cover cases, we might get small amounts, but it's quite difficult to get access to the full ones. America is a lot more, more forthcoming, shall we say, with these. And that has meant today's case has allowed me to look into who Cheyenne Nicole Jesse actually was as a person, just through the way that she actually operates in an interrogation, along with obviously looking into what created her, what her life was like, and ultimately whether there was any, shall we say, mitigating circumstances when it comes down to the actions of killing the people that she should have wanted to protect most in this world. Who was Cheyenne Nicole Jesse? Well, she lived in Lakeland, Florida. She had, I would say, quite a difficult early upbringing. She was somebody who, from what I've read in court records, certainly suffered abuse. In fact, as a young child, she was both physically and sexually abused. This is when she was living in her mother's home. And sometimes when we'll say terms like sexual and physical abuse, it's said so quickly that we often don't stop to actually punctuate that moment and recognise what we're talking about where a child is concerned. We're talking about a little girl growing up in an environment where ultimately we're talking about where the primary caregiver fails to protect the child and it leads to the most tragic of circumstances. When a child is being physically and sexually abused by the men in the mother's life who are being brought into a home that should be a safe haven for this child, understandably that's going to fracture a sense of trust in the world around them. It's going to make attachment issues more problematic because if you can't trust your mum, who can you trust? And it's also going to form some challenging relational experiences with men per se, because understandably they can't be trusted as far as the child is concerned because horrible things are happening to them. And equally, it can mean that that child grows up desperate for attention and affection. And sometimes they'll look for that attention and affection in the wrong places because of the awful psychological collateral damage that's been done through the physical and sexual abuse. So she has a difficult childhood. There is no doubt whatsoever. And we're talking about up until the age of four. And it's at this point that thank God she's actually removed from her mother's care and she's placed into the custody of her father, Mark Ivan, weekly. And he takes on the role of raising her. And it's worth noting that even though she might not remember a great deal of the abuse, what we know from a hell of a lot of research, and certainly from my own experience of working within the safeguarding of children and working with children who've been sexually abused, the impact of those early years are enormous. She may not be able to understand the true impact of what occurred to her, but I tell you now, it will have ramifications in her behavior. And for those of you who've been sexually abused, you will know exactly what I am saying. Yes, we are talking about a case where this individual becomes a murderer. Sexual abuse will absolutely not make you a murderer under 
any circumstances, but you can be somebody with the predisposition of being a murderer who was also sexually abused. But for those of you who've experienced it, you'll know it absolutely affects and shapes you. And many times it makes you a more sensitive, compassionate, loving person, somebody who understands the power of connection and uses that as a force for good. But you'll carry your scars. You can't help but carry the scars of this kind of treatment. I would say that once she's removed from her mother and given to her father, Mark, her relationship with him is good. It's a decent relationship. I wouldn't say that she was somebody who found relationships that simple. Certainly when she was at school, she was considered quite a loner. And those individuals who did get to know her and consider her a friend said that she was relatively quirky. There was a oddness about her behavior, but there was nothing that struck them as something that was going to develop into what we're talking about today. Cheyenne had quite a lot of difficulties in her early development. So she had trouble walking, she had trouble talking. But again, you have to think about the first four early years being spent in an environment that's inhospitable, that's very abusive, that's deeply challenging, and is most likely quite devoid of love. You're not going to be given the environment that's required to help you move through your developmental milestones. And what we know about children who are neglected, and without a doubt, Cheyenne was definitely neglected as a child, the reality is the impact on the brain is enormous. It causes literal brain damage. You hold a neglected child's brain up against a child who's had a loving environment. Even a child who's had an abusive environment but has had some kind of interest taken in them, the neglected brain fares very badly. And that's something that unfortunately can affect that person for the rest of their life. An elementary school teacher actually said that when Cheyenne was in the fourth grade, she was actually at the second grade level, both emotionally and academically. So on both developmental levels, she wasn't in line with her peers. And arguably, for those of you who've had children as well, who understand that developmental delay can cause concerns for them whilst they're at school, it's not just because of the academic work, it's because of the social experience. The thing about children is they're incredibly discerning. And so what you will see is where there is a group of kids, they will orientate and gravitate themselves to children who are of a similar nature or interest level. And usually on an academic level, they will also tally with kids around them who reflect the same level because understandably, they're interested in the same things. For Cheyenne, the fact that she was in a scenario where she would have found it more difficult to get involved socially, to play in a way that was in line with her peers, it's gonna mean that she's gonna end up a little bit more isolated. And as we all know, isolation leads to a sense of loneliness and loneliness obviously adds another psychological debilitating level to the experience and Cheyenne is obviously a young person who therefore has had so many problems at this point and there's a lot of work for her to do to catch up essentially with her peers. Now as she gets older she seems to do okay. Cheyenne starts working at a Lowe's in Plant City so she works as a cashier there and even though she's obviously struggled in the past, I think we can all accept that if you are a cashier, you can deal with money, you can deal with customer service, you can deal with conflict. There's a whole heap of requirements that you need to have about you on a personality level to do that job. So she's somebody who's front facing, she's working with the general public and she's doing okay. One of the things that does happen to her though when she's relatively young is she goes on to have a child and that child she names Meredith Leanne. Jessie. So she has this little girl. And from the get-go, there is obviously a level of dysfunction. Meredith's father isn't involved at all. He lives in Georgia and he didn't, shall we say, take any responsibility for her. He had very little to do with Meredith. And whilst we can say that it's not ideal to have a child when you are a single parent because it's more challenging, particularly if you're young, the truth is Parents who go ahead and have children, even though they haven't got a supportive partner, we've got to give them credit for going ahead and doing so because essentially it's far easier to just walk away from the situation as does Meredith's father. So like I said, Cheyenne at least takes responsibility and does initially want to have her daughter and goes ahead and does so. Meredith, when she was born, had a really close relationship with her grandfather, Mark. So he was very invested. He wanted to help out, he wanted to help take care of Meredith, and that's exactly what you want where grandparents are concerned. 
You want them to feel a part of your child's life. You want them to ideally be there for childcare purposes because I don't know, it reduces the cost, let's be honest. But also there's just something about having that older, wiser counterpart in your world. And bear in mind, Shiana had had a good relationship with her father. So arguably this means that she's gonna want her daughter to be around him. And Mark's brother was quoted as saying that Mark really cared for his granddaughter. And he said that he didn't believe that he would ever hurt her. And one of Mark's friends said, he would rather you take his life than mess with that baby. Now, when it comes down to Cheyenne's daughter, Meredith had issues. There is no doubt whatsoever. She had some very extreme behavioral and emotional conditions. And any parent out there who has got a child that isn't typical and every single child is unique every single child is beautiful in their own regard in their own way but for typical children where their vocabulary of emotion and behavior is at a level where for the most part parents can cope it's very different if you have atypical circumstances as a parent and you're looking into the lives of those individuals who seem to be able to manage their world and their children's behavior within that world effectively but unfortunately, it doesn't always play out that way. Many of you may have experienced children with a behavioural issue and you're trying your best and you're going out of your way to do what you can. But for whatever reason, there is something deeper going on. And it feels as if Meredith fits that category, that her behavioural and emotional conditions are pretty extreme. And Cheyenne actually sought psychiatric help for Meredith. And at one point she was held in hospital under the state's Baker Act. So the Baker Act is a Florida law that actually enables families and loved ones to provide emergency mental health services and also temporary detention for people who are impaired because of their mental illness. And also if they're a person who is unable to actually determine that they need treatment, for example. So it's where it steps in and takes away the opportunity for that individual to make decisions for themselves, they make decisions for them. So the act itself was named after somebody called Maxine Baker, and that was a former Miami State representative, and they sponsored the act in 1972. So people who require the use of the Baker Act, it means that it's likely they'll have lost a sense of self-control, and that there is a possibility that they'll inflict harm either to themselves or others. So it's used rarely of course because it can only be used in situations where the person's mental illness meets all of the remaining criteria for either voluntary or involuntary admission so it's not about them just saying we're going to take away all your rights and responsibilities you have to meet strict criteria for this act to be placed and it's about protecting the individual who may be struggling who indeed may not realize that they are struggling in the uk we have sectioning and here it can be voluntary or it can be non-voluntary, but essentially it means the same. It means that an individual is acting in a way where there is a likelihood that they may cause harm to themselves or indeed to another person. They may not be able to have the self-awareness that they're in that situation, and so the state takes over. So this had occurred at this point. Also, Meredith received mental health counselling, and this actually involved overnight stays in a mental health facility in Orlando. So. That is pretty high level when we're thinking about somebody's emotional and mental instability. For the most part, things can be managed in the community. Even when people have quite extreme mental illnesses, we see that there are support frameworks and networks that allow that individual to remain at home. So when somebody is admitted to a hospital, it can be that they are fundamentally the main issue and they literally need to be put in that place for their own safety. But if you have a strong family support network, often that won't happen. So I have lived that with my father and the reality is that he was far better at home no matter how extreme his behavior was during his psychosis. And therefore it was often a situation where he would be in and then I would pull him out straight away so that I could look after him at home. And a lot of you who have dealt with mental health issues yourselves, you'll probably also accept that orienting yourself towards a place of safety often means orientating yourself to a place that is familiar to you and the home is the most familiar of all. So if you don't have that support network around you, let's say where Cheyenne is concerned, if Cheyenne is actually in a circumstance where as a mother she isn't the most, shall we say, 
appropriate person to care for her child because she hasn't got the resources and skills, she's probably more likely to allow her daughter to end up in a mental health facility as opposed to do the work herself. And I'm not trying to be nasty to Xi'an. I appreciate that she was probably struggling deeply with the fact that her daughter wasn't acting in a way that she had wanted her daughter to act like, because no parent wants a child to struggle. But I also feel that she was probably quite glad of the break whenever her child was away. And I don't really feel that Cheyenne was the most committed parent, full stop. So Cheyenne and her daughter, Meredith, end up living with Cheyenne's father, Mark. This is in South Lakeland, and that happens until they end up moving in with Cheyenne's boyfriend. Now, Cheyenne's boyfriend was Matthew Monroe. He's known as Cody. And Cody worked at a Walmart. The relationship between Cody and Cheyenne got serious extremely quickly, which is something that is common. You meet somebody, you really like them, you want to be around them, you imagine that they're going to answer all of your prayers, you throw caution to the wind, you admit how strongly you feel with each other, and you move in at times together very quickly. We see that play out consistently and constantly in the world around us. Is it good sense? Absolutely not. Is it good sense when you've got a child? Never. Let's be honest. You don't know the person. I'm not saying that Cody was a bad guy. I'm saying she didn't know him. So... To uproot a child with emotional and psychological issues that are so extreme, they're warranting her being placed under a specific act for her own safety, it's probably not the best idea, Cheyenne, to actually take her to a stranger's place and say, hey, now we're a family. If a child is acting out on an emotional and behavioral level, consistency and security formulate a really important part of how their world is and how they act within it. So if you are going to reach in, drag them from one situation of something they feel supportive and familiar within and place them in a completely unfamiliar situation, their emotional, psychological and behavioral issues are going to go through the roof. Why? Because it's unfamiliar, it's unsafe, there isn't a consistency and they've had a lack of control. Because bear in mind, whilst People have mental illnesses that make them act in ways outside of what we would suggest is typical within the world around us and is something they don't have control over. Also, what we see with young people is on a behavioural level, even if you take away the fact that there might be a mental illness there and just look at the behavioural and emotional concerns, when you don't like your scenario and your situation and you don't have power over that situation because somebody else has made the decisions for you, you are going to sometimes create actions that are symptomatic of your unhappiness. And you will be angrier, you will be more disrespectful, you will be more destructive because you're trying to let the world around you know, I'm not happy. And I think where this scenario really starts to go wrong is that she's been moved somewhere that she isn't happy. It's exacerbated and amplified her already problematic behaviours and emotional dysfunction. And essentially, she's now powerless. So it's upping the ante where her behaviour is concerned. And no one's going to be happy about that. But you have to feel utterly sorry for Meredith. Because I imagine with all the things that she's dealing with on a mental health level and with all the other issues that she's facing, a move in with a strange guy probably wasn't the best thing for her. So they're falling in love. Meredith is now living with them and he is living basically in a camper on his parents' property. Now, I like traveling. I enjoy the odd weekend in a camper van. But if you're asking me, would I ever, as a single parent, have thought, oh, you know what? You know what I need? I need to fall in love with a guy who's living in a camper on his parents' property. I'll just take my kids with me. What could possibly go wrong? It makes perfect sense at the end of the day. If I'm not happy living in a camper on somebody else's drive, I don't know what I'm doing on a Thursday afternoon. Seriously, this kid's got big problems. And mum thinks it's a great idea to move in with a guy that apparently she's in love with in his camper on his parents' property. And I would say there is a really emotionally immature relationship between Cheyenne as a mother and her daughter Meredith because as a parent, you are not meant to engage in volatility. I do appreciate that some people shout. I don't think it's effective. Most of the time, if you shout at somebody, 
it closes them down. Just put yourself in the position of somebody coming up to you in a shop and just shouting randomly at you because, I don't know, you got in the way of them getting the pasta sauce. You're going to have a series of feelings. One of them might be, I'm going to punch you in the face. Another might be, I can't hear what's happening. This is shocking me. Another one might be just to totally freeze. Another one might be to run. But what we know is it's incredibly stressful to have somebody shouting at you. And when you're a child, you have very little power. So it's even more stressful if an adult who should know better is shouting at you. And for a child with emotional and psychological issues, that's not going to be a positive exchange when the parent, who essentially is meant to be guiding you, navigating things for you, being a mentor to you, is actually being very volatile with you. So even though there's this tumultuous relationship, because Meredith's got these conditions, it is exacerbated by the way that her mother is treating her when they are having conflict. And it is for Cheyenne to actually reduce the escalation of these issues so that she can act as a parent and not as an enemy which it really does sound that she was acting like. They were apparently constantly fighting. This really also impacted on Meredith and Cody forming a relationship. Because understandably for Cody, he is not happy that, I don't know, the camper van, which I can't imagine was luxurious. Can't imagine it was an enormous camper van where you had different suites within it. I imagine it was quite tight and cramped and challenging. So add to that screaming and shouting and throwing things, not exactly ideal. So understandably, Cody's like, you know what? Maybe you need to move back with your father. Maybe you need to take Meredith back to her grandfather because at the end of the day, that's where she feels safe and secure. And at the end of the day, it means that I won't have to hear you screaming at one another in my very small camper van on my parents' drive. And bear in mind, as I'm talking about these altercations between Meredith and her mother, Meredith's under six years of age. She dies at six years of age. Just put that in your mind, because what I've described, and certainly what Cheyenne was describing regarding their relationship, is if we're dealing with a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, a young person who's completely out of control and has the physical domination and physical strength to cause problems to a point where a parent feels totally helpless. There is not a six-year-old on this planet that cannot be managed by an adult parent because an adult parent is physically dominating. I'm not suggesting that you are there to be violent, to control your child through this kind of discipline. I'm saying that you are able to contain and restrain them. So even if you have to go on a restraining course where you can do it in a safe method and manner, you are going to be able to dominate them. And also, why would you be in a tumultuous relationship where you are arguing with a child? It is not a mother or father's job to engage in an argument with a child. You are engaging in a situation that firstly is not going to end well because they are a kid. They can't understand the nuances of being a grown up. They can't understand the analysis of the position that you wish them to entertain and engage within. They are a kid. They are full of emotions and reactions. Your job is to be very neutral, very calm, even in the face of challenging behavior so that they have a safe space and place to go. And she's not doing that. It's clear that Cheyenne is somebody who genuinely does not put the work into the relationship that she needs to work at if she's actually going to help her daughter at all. So now Cody has basically said, I've had enough, you need to go back to your dad's, you need to get things sorted if we're gonna stay together because I can't handle this dysfunction. So they end up moving back to Cheyenne's father's and he allows them to do so. They go back for several weeks, but when they return to Cody, the fighting continues. Of course it does, because nothing's actually been resolved. She's just gone and spent time elsewhere without putting any work in. And if you don't put the work in, you're literally gonna get absolutely no change whatsoever. And for Meredith, that's gonna be again, more dysfunction because she's been moved yet again. And she was probably happier being at home with granddad, somebody who's familiar and has brought her up, than with Cody, who clearly doesn't want her. And children, no matter what situation they're in, understand whether they're wanted or otherwise. And Cody didn't want her. End of. 
and she would have been picking up on that consistently. Now, something really strange happens, really odd, very unsettling, because we're talking about a six-year-old little girl and a 50-year-old grandfather simply disappearing. So it's July 2015. Mark and Meredith just vanish into thin air. And in spite of the fact that they've been gone at this point, allegedly for almost a week, with no one hearing from them, the police were not informed of it until more than a week had passed. So this little girl with all of these issues and this grandfather just disappear and nobody has informed the authorities. At this point, Cheyenne does inform the authorities. So she reports the missing on the 1st of August, 2015. And the story that she suggests to the authorities is that she basically last seen them when she dropped Meredith off at Mark, her father's address on the 18th of July, 2015. She said that she then spoke to her father on the 19th of July and that she'd also received text messages between the 20th and the 22nd of July. She also said that her boyfriend, Cody, he'd also received text messages. Now, the reason that she actually gets in contact with the authorities isn't because she's thinking, oh my God, where's my daughter? Where's my father? No, hadn't occurred to her, in spite of the fact that they just disappeared of the face of the earth. No, the reason that she eventually gets in contact with the authorities is because her family, in the wider sense, are realising that her daughter and father are missing. So now she's in that rock and a hard place. Obviously, she's not that concerned, but the family around her are concerned and she's going to have to go ahead and actually let the police know. Also, it's noted that one of Mark's friends also saw both him and Meredith on the 18th of July. So it's kind of corroborated that the last time that Cheyenne says that she saw her father, so too did one of his friends. And she said that Mark had actually told her that he was planning to visit Georgia. And the reason that he was going to visit Georgia was that he wanted to visit Meredith's paternal grandparents. And he was waiting for Cheyenne to actually provide an address for him. Now, Vicky said that she was actually suspicious quite quickly because she returned to the property on the 22nd of July and she actually saw Cheyenne removing property from the residence. And it didn't make sense. Bear in mind, She's spoken to Cheyenne's father, Mark, who suggested that he might be visiting Georgia, but he's not said he's leaving the area. So why is Cheyenne removing property from the residence? It just doesn't make any sense. So now detectives get involved, because obviously they're not just dealing with a missing man, they're dealing with a missing six-year-old, and that's really scary. Something terrible could have happened to both of them, and they're very concerned that it's taken this amount of time for Cheyenne to actually get in contact with them, because it's her daughter. You would imagine that she would be absolutely frantic if Mark, her father, had just upped and left. She goes ahead and says to the detectives she wasn't that concerned because she knew that Mark had taken Meredith to Georgia. Then she claims that Mark had texted a boyfriend, said that he was taking Meredith and he was going to leave Florida. And this is the piece de resistance of the story, that he was going to leave the area because he only had a year to live and he wanted to spend the remainder of his life with his granddaughter. He also conveniently said in the message that he wanted them to dispose of his personal belongings or sell them. Now just let's think about that for a minute. Throwing it out there. When my father was alive, he was very close to my children, if I had got a text message because one of my boys had been staying with him and that text message had said, I have a year to live, I'm taking your child and I'm going off into the never-never to live out the rest of my days, probably without medical insurance, in a strange environment without a home, with literally nobody to support me, what's to worry about? Just make sure that, as a favour, you go and get rid of my couch. You would be firstly thinking, well, Dad's definitely had a serious breakdown. Secondly, call the authorities immediately. Thirdly, bring me back my child so that they can be in the safety of my arms. You're not gonna be like, oh my God, that's a lot of news to receive. Dad's going to die within a year. Gladys told me. 
He's taking my child because understandably he just wants to live out his days with the joy of my offspring because they're so wonderful. I understand it. And at the end of the day, I could worry or I could just nonchalantly allow them to continue to skip off together into the sunset whilst I flog all of their property on Facebook Marketplace. That makes no sense whatsoever. And you can imagine to a seasoned detective, the alarm bells will have been so loud that I imagine that pretty much the area within 10 kilometers from the scene of the crime all required some kind of earwear to stop the ringing amplifying through their brains. But this is what's apparently happened. So Cheyenne's like, oh, well, okay, no problem. You've taken my child and you're dying. But she just goes back to the house, removes the property because she's going to sell it. So the police are hearing this, deeply concerned, come to the house because they want to search it. And I would say that one of the things that's very clear from watching the interrogation and the interviews with Cheyenne is she is not the brightest person. Now, arguably, the prosecution state that she had an average IQ. The average IQ is 100, and the average person with an IQ of 100 is very bright with respect. Human beings are, on the whole, very bright. I did not genuinely feel that when you listen to her, that IQ is represented. But nonetheless, I can't argue with what is documented. To me, Cheyenne sounds on the lower scale IQ wise but as I said that's just my own opinion but I do think it's substantiated by the fact that initially when the police come she actually signs a consent to search waiver for Mark's residence so the police come to her father's and she could arguably say well no you're gonna have to come back with a warrant but she allows them in and if you've done something that shall we say is going to be causing suspicion to be placed on you in that home why would you invite them in if you're a bright person? Other people could say, well, because if you're somebody who isn't necessarily super bright, but isn't stupid, you might imagine that by inviting the police into your home, it makes you seem innocent. So by saying, oh yeah, you can go and search my dad's home, it's gonna make them feel less likely that she's done something wrong. But I just think it's a massive mistake because if you are a criminal and you have done something awful, the last thing you want is the police coming in to that residence where there might be lots of incriminating information. Now, when they get in there immediately, they know something horrible has played out. And the reason for that is multifold. First of all, it's the foul odour. And when you listen to detectives and investigators talk about decay and the smell of decay, they always talk about the fact one smell never forgotten. We are hardwired as human beings to note the smell of rotting meat. And the reason for that is understandable because it means that we're not going to eat it. That's the primary reasoning why when something smells grossly and off, we're not going to put it in our mouths. It prevents us getting disease. But also when it's human decay, it's an additional level because clearly it's indicating to us that something terrible might have happened and to get out of the way. It's a primordial response. It means that if we smell it, think about in the old days, you know, where there might have been a saber-toothed tiger on the loose eating you. The point is that if you smelt decaying flesh, you'd be like, I need to hot foot it out of here straight away. This is not a safe place. So understandably, that's why police say when they smell it, they never forget it. And they instantly think this is a smell that is decomposing human flesh. They also notice that there are quite a lot of large flies dead on the floor. And that means there's been a life cycle. And you have to consider that when you think about the fact that flies arrive from maggots all the way through to actually becoming the live flies that you see annoying you and buzzing around and then they die. It's a relatively quick life cycle, but it indicates that there's been a period of time where that's been happening, where they've actually been a maggot all the way through to the actual fly dying as a fully fledged fly. Now, allegedly, Cheyenne's got a reason for this, of course she has. And her reason is that the smell is because of a dead raccoon under her porch. I kid you not. I don't know whether she didn't have a lot of time to think about that, but that's the excuse that she comes up with. She also talks about the fact that there'd been a rat infestation and they'd been there as well. A lot of death in the... You don't want to go 
to this property if you're a rodent of any type. It doesn't end well for you, according to Cheyenne. But this is basically the story that she's given. Oh yeah, there is a bad smell, because what they also noticed is there were quite a lot of candles burning. There were things there to try to hide the odour, but as anybody knows, if there is a sick and grotesque smell and you put something that smells nice over it, it kind of amplifies it. It makes it smell even worse because there's this rottenness beneath the sweetness and that's really conflicting for the brain. But this is what she's saying, that the reason that they can smell decomposition is because of the rats and then finally because of this dead raccoon under the porch. They also immediately notice that the sofas in the home are covered with sheets. So, they go and have a gander, don't they? They want to see what's under the sheets. And immediately they notice that the furniture's got these really dark coloured stains and they're immediately sent off for testing and when the tests come back, it's discovered to be human blood, but they already realised that that's what they were looking at. They knew that something terrible had happened in that home. Also, when they're looking at the sofas themselves, they see that they've actually got punctures and slashes on the fabric and they can see that that's consistent with knife or stab marks or cut marks. So now they've got a crime scene as far as they're concerned that smells of rotting human flesh with blood stained furniture with stab marks within that furniture. They might not have bodies but they've certainly got something that indicates bodies would have been there at some point. Understandably suspicion falls immediately on Cheyenne and one of the big reasons for that is she doesn't know how to hold a story. I appreciate that no one wants these kind of individuals to be good liars but there are some individuals who can usually put a story together that it seems like it could have some kind of truth embedded within it. It just isn't the case where Cheyenne is concerned. She does not have a linear story. She hasn't thought ahead. She hasn't been consequential in what she's done. And it's absolutely demonstrated when they're asking her questions because she doesn't know how to come across as authentic. And she also doesn't know how to hold order. So even though we see liars being quite linear because obviously they want to go through a story in a certain order because they don't want to forget it. Whereas obviously when you're telling the truth, you don't have to do that. And often you'll remember extra bits and pieces. At least liars who are doing that are trying to do it because ultimately they want to seem like they're telling the truth. Cheyenne doesn't come across like that at all. She's not planned on this situation. She's not planned on somebody actually being concerned about her father and her daughter having gone missing. It's almost like she imagined that they would just disappear. That text message would be accepted as verbatim that he just wandered off into the distance with this small child and was going to die happily somewhere at some point in the future. So investigators at this point, they bring Cheyenne in for questioning because they've got all these findings from the search. And um, it's clear from the get go in the actual interview that they are fully aware that she has been involved in disappearance and likely death of both her father and her daughter. They are quite pushy in the interrogation because they are not buying into any of the things that she's suggesting. Her story is very much that as far as she's concerned, her father and her daughter have just gone off. Nothing bad has happened to them. She's had nothing to do with what's happened. Yes, they're telling her that blood is at the place and now she's thinking, well, maybe something bad has happened to them, but I've had nothing to do with it. And she sticks to this story for quite a long period of time. You pull out a raccoon from under the house. Yes, and why did you do that? I stuck. Okay, and where did you throw it? I, I just threw it. And did you see it where? Like, it, I, it's not like it hit the woods. But do you remember telling me that you used tongs to take the raccoon because you said you weren't going to touch it? Do you remember yeah. saying that? Well, why did you say that? Because it's not true, right? Cheyenne? It's not true. See what I'm saying? If you're concerned about it, be honest. Just be honest. That's all I'm asking. You're not being honest. You're not even crying. Prove me that you care. Maybe you're dehydrated, but you've been drinking water. I don't, I don't understand. So prove to me that you're halfway decent mother and tell me the truth. Because this is not going away. Okay? This is not going away. No, you're not. And I want you to sit up and look at me, please. Because that's not working, right? 
This little show is not working. You're not crying. There's not one tear. Your daughter is missing. I tell you, there's blood now, and not one tear is falling from the face. She trips herself up time and time again. For example, she talks about using tongs to actually move a raccoon, and it wouldn't physically be possible for her to do that. And again, she isn't able to make sense of the story that she's giving the investigators. And that means that they're able to push her more and more. And they keep saying to her that they know that something bad has happened, that she must be a bad mother unless she's going to admit that she's done something terrible. And essentially over a period of time, they put her into a corner and she can't escape from that corner. And it is absolutely mind boggling that she believed at any point that she was going to be able to get away with what she did. Because when she eventually confesses to the police that she is indeed responsible for the disappearance of Mark and Meredith, she still holds on to what can only be described as a completely outlandish reason behind it. And there are points before she gets to her mission where you hear how she's scrabbling to try to make sense of what she's describing and to try to seem like she's being honest. And she says things like, sometimes she takes her medication and then she just totally blacks out. Just blacks out. You know, takes her medication, doesn't remember anything. Yeah. So what happened to you, Pat? What are you reading? I just remember yelling at him and he came at me and that's all I remember. That his house? Yeah, I remember hearing the, the, like a boom. Then what happened? I don't remember, I was, uh, I was yelling as I was walking out the door. Now, again, I appreciate there are some very strong medications on the market. I do appreciate that, for example, should you take a certain amount of these kind of prescription drugs that is more than your prescription level required, you may find yourself blacking out. But I'm pretty sure pretty pretty sure that there are very few times where an individual just takes medication that is appropriate and has been given to them by an appropriate medical expert that they take it and then completely black out and forget everything. I am pretty sure that if you're regularly taking a medication and it's doing that to you, you're not going to take it because you're going to think oh, that's probably not okay. It probably wasn't okay that I got in the car, took that medication. Don't even know how I got to Tesco. No, it's not the way it works. But you can see she's trying to interweave these excuses. Oh, at the end of the day, it wasn't my fault. I was blacking out. And she's kind of punctuating the interview with these ridiculous excuses. But nonetheless, something that she's trying to levy could mean that maybe she had done something. She just didn't know she'd done it because this prescription medication she'd been given was just so powerful blanked out her memory, she collapsed, but was also able to do really heinous things. So like I said, it's not adding up. It won't actually play out in reality. It won't be a suitable excuse, but this is where she's going. So when she's asked about what happened, it's ludicrous, according to her. Apparently on the 18th of July, she gets back to her father's address and she and her father get into a heated argument based on the fact that he basically says to her that she's just like her mother. Now she takes that essentially in an offensive way because she feels that that means that he's indicating that she's a really bad mum. I do genuinely think that her father had a point. Bear in mind, I'm literally talking about the fact that she kills her child. I think that if he did say that, and it's doubtful that he did say that, but if he did say that, I would be on Mark's side. I would be like, you know what? You're worse than your mother with respect. But this is what she suggests is the prelude to what plays out. So now she's really upset. He's calling her a bad mother and therefore it escalates. So then they get into a physical altercation and apparently her father attacks her 
Of course he does, because now she's suggesting that she would be defending herself if anything happens. So even though she isn't the brightest person, she certainly knows that you are far more likely to get off with a situation criminally if you can evidence that, that you were defending yourself. So she's throwing it in that Mark, her father, is the antagonist in the situation. He's being very nasty about her as a mother and now he's physically assaulting her. Now, apparently during this altercation, bear in mind, her father would without a doubt be able to dominate her on every level. If we're talking about a man attacking a female and that female is unarmed at the time, there is a strong likelihood that the female is going to come to serious harm because like it or otherwise, females are less powerful physically than males. So they're having this fight. Apparently she must be given as good as she gets because she seems to be holding her own. She's not been thrown to the floor and is now completely helpless. And apparently this pocket knife just falls out of her pocket. Now, if you are dealing with a physically dominant male attacking you, the likelihood of you noticing a pocket knife falling out of your pocket, well, that in itself would be very unusual because the actual fear you'd be engaging with and the need to fight back would be so serious that you wouldn't be listening to the chink of a pocket knife falling on the floor. But she says, Mark notices it, her father notices it, and he decides that he's going to try to grab it. So she said that during this struggle, Meredith, her daughter, was accidentally stabbed in the throat by her grandfather. She then said that her father attempted to stab her, and in order to fight him off, she stabbed him. Now work that out as you will. Riddle me that, would you? Would you riddle me that? We're talking about a situation where apparently this woman, it falls out of her pocket, her father grabs it to apparently deal with her, I imagine, but then he stabs his granddaughter and that does nothing to deter him from continuing to try to attack his daughter, but very fortunately, for Cheyenne, she manages to grab it, overpowers the grandfather, her father, and actually manages to stab him instead. Then, in all of this, he reaches for a handgun, goes to shoot the gun, but because she is, I don't know, Iron Man, she manages to push the gun away from her and it goes upwards, it discharges and it strikes him in the head. Wow. I mean, that makes sense. I can imagine that that is absolutely what would occur. That makes perfect, perfect logic. Imagine that the police officers are like, yeah, that happens every few days. You'd be amazed at how dangerous pocket knives are and how it can lead to this kind of serious crime. But this is what she has now suggested, that somehow she is an innocent victim, her father is the antagonist and her daughter is unfortunately a victim of circumstance. I'm here with my dad, my daughter really hard and away from me. She's here to her freaking mom. What happened? What happened when you pushed your daughter? Where'd she fly into? She fell into. She fell into the knife that he had. That he always carried. She fell into the knife? He had a, he had a knife in his hand? Did that hurt her? Well, she fell into it, like, where did it hit her? Did knife hit her in her neck? Blood? And that is highly manipulative, because of course that isn't what's happened. We all are aware that her father hasn't done this. Even if there had been some kind of altercation, he hasn't deserved being stabbed and shot through the head. And her daughter, her six-year-old child, and even though we know she's going to be banged to rights in this case, she wants to blame the man who loves her daughter, the grandfather who actually didn't find her too much of a problem, the father figure in her daughter's life who was there for her. And now she's blaming him for her death. She said that after she had discharged this by mistake, essentially in her father's head, she then grabs the weapon because she's in such shock and she fires it several more times. So now she's just randomly shot the gun time and time again. And 
you would think at that point she'd be losing her mind because of course what's going to be your main issue in that moment you're going to think oh my god my child's been injured what do i do who do i call how do i help that's not what she does we're expected to believe this story where she's accidentally been involved in her father dying she's accidentally been involved in her daughter being stabbed and yet the next course of action isn't to ring the emergency services the next course of action is to change out of her blood-stained clothes take the gun and leave she does absolutely nothing as far as informing the relevant authorities that this has happened if this is an accident if she's defending herself then the first line of defense is to call the police and let them know and also to get the emergency responders there just in case there is a hope that her beautiful child could potentially survive because she'd done nothing wrong according to her she was simply an individual who walked into a house and was attacked and this was the consequence that was her defense therefore use that appropriately call the police but no and then between the 20th and the 22nd of july she actually goes back to the home and that's with one main intention which is to clean the scene up so she tries to get rid of the smell with those air freshers i was talking about she also got a shovel because she literally had to scrape the bodily fluids off the floor and all the human decomposition she then went and covered the sofas in sheets because they were blood stained and the investigators actually said that the floors were so saturated with blood that it had literally soaked through the wood floor and had been dripping under the house when she's confessing she also said that that text message that cody her boyfriend received yeah the message that was allegedly from her father's phone she sent it and in the interview itself the police are making it clear to her when they're actually having that conversation with her that they know they're going to find that out anyway so even though she admits it to be fair the police have kind of given her an abc of investigating and said we are going to find this out so you may as well acknowledge that the phone will have been sent that message probably in a locality where your phone and your father's phone are also close by because they know that she would have been present doing that she also said that on the 22nd of july that's when she takes the bodies and she places them in plastic totes and the reason that she actually did that was apparently she took the idea from the tv show criminal minds she then moved the bodies in her chevrolet suburban and she then moved their bodies into the landlord's shed who was out of town at that point so we get to the 1st of August 2015. This is when the bodies of both Mark and Meredith were found. And actually they were found just 200 yards away from Mark's home in the neighbour's shed. So she hadn't actually moved the bodies far at all. And how harrowing for the neighbours to know that all the while that little girl's body was so close by. The bodies, like she suggested, were indeed in plastic tote bags, one on top of the other. And when they looked at the bodies both of them had stab wounds and both of them had gunshot wounds so again this idea that this had been an accidental killing it's just blown apart immediately when they look at the bodies themselves now understandably Cheyenne isn't the only person in the frame Cody is also questioned and he said that when he was reflecting on what could have played out that he had actually been arguing with Cheyenne about Meredith's behavioural issues. He was really struggling with the child and he'd actually said to Cheyenne that he wasn't going to stay with her unless she got control over Meredith's behaviour. So this seems to have been a big trigger. Cheyenne has decided that she's in love with Cody, that she wants to be with Cody, that Meredith is essentially the bane of her life and is now interfering with her happiness on a level that could break down her relationship with Cody and she's not happy. And there is nothing so brutal, there is nothing so dark, there is nothing so diabolical of an individual being so egocentric and so selfish and self-motivated that they look at another human being and think that they are such a problem that if they were removed, their life would be better. And removing them, even in such a permanent way as killing, is far preferable than looking at other alternative avenues there were so many other options let's be honest with respect mark 
Meredith's grandfather actually looked after her often. He could have had her. He could have taken care of her. I'm sure he would have. It might not have been a perfect situation, but it's far better than killing the child. Also, let's be honest, Child Protective Services, they would have dealt with it too. If she didn't want her daughter, her daughter could have been handed over. Again, that isn't ideal. We're not talking about a child as if they are property. But my God, that's a far better solution than stabbing and shooting her because your boyfriend isn't interested in raising the child with you. And also, it's very telling to me that somebody like Cheyenne was willing to have a man exert that level of power over her to such a degree that she felt so desperate to be in a relationship with him that she was even contemplating dumping her child in any way, shape or form. If a guy says that to you, it is the immediate response of 96% of people to say, move on, jog on flower, you're not coming near me because if you can't accept that my child with their problems or otherwise is the most wonderful addition to your life, you are not worth my time. So it demonstrates that Cheyenne clearly had attachment issues because she wanted to cling on to him at all costs. And apparently when he was interviewed by the police, he said that she had been asking him some quite concerning questions. So she asked questions about how long bodies take to decompose, how long maggots take to consume a body. I know that all of us have a mindset that is intrigued in such areas and circumstances. Most of us would just Google it, throwing it out there. Just have a Google. It tends to be very effective at giving you the answers that you need. But she's having that conversation with him. Now, there are different levels to this psychologically. Level one, she's asking him questions because she wants him to ask her questions about why she's asking him those things. And that could be to bring him in to the culpability to say, look, we are both involved in this now. She doesn't want to feel as alone in her actions. It could be genuinely that she wants to know and she thinks that he's an individual who would be able to tell her. That's obviously the most linear explanation. But like I said, for me, it's probably more likely that she wants to tell him what she's done and she's giving him these little snippets of information to get him to ask those challenging questions that maybe she isn't comfortable actually stating answers to. So this is what's playing out. Yes, he's finding it a bit weird, but obviously not weird enough to go, why are you asking me these questions? Have you killed people? Because like I said, it's very unusual for a person to actually specifically ask the partner this. You would just Google it. There is a reason and a motivation behind her doing that. And she also asked him whether bodies would fit in a plastic tote. Now, again, I know all of us are intrigued by crime. We like to think about how murderers think. We like to look at information around how bodies decompose, not because it thrills us, quite the contrary, because it disgusts us, but because we like to understand what happens, how things play out, and realistically how investigations work. But if your partner's asking you really specific questions, come on. I'd be thinking to myself, my God, are they going to kill me? They're asking me how long it takes for a body to decompose, how long it'll take for maggots to eat it, and also will that tote bag that I bought last Saturday work for putting a body in? It's a really strange set and series of questions. So Cody didn't apparently know that she'd killed them, but was a little bit disconcerted by the questions that she was asking. So at this point, Cheyenne is essentially accused of brutally killing her father and daughter, and they piece together that they genuinely believe that she killed them on the 18th of July 2015. And the reason that Cheyenne actually killed Meredith was to appease her boyfriend. He was threatening to break up over her. He was saying that he wasn't happy with the child's behaviour, and therefore she wanted Meredith gone. But of course, that doesn't provide a reason for the actual killing of her father. They said that Cheyenne would have gone to Mark's house on the 18th of July armed so that she went prepared, she had a knife, she had a handgun, and that she intentionally entered that home to kill. I think it's probably likely they did get into a row, 
I don't think it would be very difficult with the amount of emotional collateral that was around regarding Mark and Cheyenne's relationship because of Meredith and because of the dysfunction that Meredith and her mother had. I imagine that Mark probably had levels of frustration that could have been projected on to his daughter. So I think it would have been relatively easy to get into a scenario where there was some kind of conflict that may have made Cheyenne feel that she had a permission base to kill him and her daughter. That could possibly be why she went with those arms, but also likely got involved in a conflict because it allowed her to feel that she had a right to do what she did. Because for one, we know that Cody wanted Meredith to some degree out of their lives. Maybe she went around and told Mark that she wanted him to take care of her daughter full time and he was absolutely annoyed by this because it was her responsibility, not his. And that would have given her license to get into an argument and then use the weapons that she brought. Now, bear in mind, Mark was stabbed by Cheyenne at least 12 times and he was shot in the head three times. It's massive overkill. Meredith, she was repeatedly stabbed and then she was shot in the back of the head by her mother. And after she had murdered both of these people that she should have loved and protected, because bear in mind, we're talking about the mother doing this and doing it in a very violent way. The last thing that her little girl would have seen was that woman stabbing her to death and then shooting her. That image is horrific to conceive of. But then after she's done it, she just leaves. Leaves the bodies there for several days. And then obviously comes back because she tries to cover her tracks. Then she puts them in the plastic totes. And bear in mind, the bodies at this point were decomposing for two weeks and it was July, so it was very hot. So she really did create an issue for the investigation because the more decomposition that takes place often, the more difficult it is for the pathologist to identify how the individual was killed. So she destroyed, she concealed, and she removed evidence relating to that incident. Also, when it came down to the police looking at what she suggested played out during the situation with her father and her daughter, they said that literally none of the evidence supported that she'd killed Mark in self-defence and that, of course, she'd accidentally killed Meredith. It was ludicrous because one of the most obvious things is that she had no injuries herself. So she had no injuries to her own face, no injuries to her own neck. She had no defensive marks at all on her arms or on her hands. And they would have been there if she had actually been in such a physically violent altercation that she described. So there was literally no evidence suggesting that she got into that physical altercation with him. And what I find ultimately chilling is that after she has literally brutally murdered her daughter and her father in such a grotesque way, she just carried on going to work. Literally carried on going to work as if nothing had happened. How do you hold the horror of what you've done in your head and just carry on working front facing with the general public as if everything is okay to me that speaks of a particular mindset mentality and personality it's deeply cold it's deeply malevolent and it's capable of great evil for the most part if you had shall we say, found yourself in a situation where you'd killed somebody even by mistake, the likelihood is it would traumatise you to such a degree that even waking each morning would be filled with horror. The moment you'd come to, if you even had the ability to sleep, every second would be infected with that horror. But not Cheyenne. She just goes about her business. She gets charged, of course, with two counts of first degree murder and one count of tampering with evidence. She was held without bond because you don't want somebody of her nature walking the streets. And when Cheyenne was actually denied bond, apparently her family members were seen to be really relieved. Mark's brothers cried. They hugged one another because, understandably, it would be scary for them to know that she was on the streets. And also because occasionally people do just leave the area and it can take time for them to be rearrested if arrested at all. 
It does seem that she did have some problems in the past because she had been arrested once before and she was actually arrested in another state for assaulting a past boyfriend. So historically, clearly there is a violence around her nature. And as I talked about so far in this case, you don't get anything more violent, disturbing and sinister as the scene that we know played out when she murdered her father and her daughter. Police were apparently really disturbed by the case. Of course, any child murder is going to be terrifying and upsetting and devastating for the police. They take it very personally when they lose little ones. Polk County Sheriff said, nothing's more horrific than the murder of a child except when it's done by a parent. This is the face and this is the eyes of a cold-blooded murderer. She not only murdered them, but left them in the residence for many days until it became painfully evident she had to move them. Like I said, these particular police, when they have to manage homicides of children, they take it so personally. Often I listen to investigators discuss child murders and the experience stains their conscience. They hold on to the faces. They hold on to the memories of those kids. They give them legacy by those memories. And without a doubt, Meredith did that for so many officers who were involved in this case. And that's a good thing because Meredith was an incalculably important human being and Meredith was murdered by the very person that she should, to all intents and purposes, have been able to trust more than anybody else in this world. And sadly, that simply wasn't the case. Now, the family of Mark and Meredith, they were actually hoping that Cheyenne would get the death penalty for the murders. Mark's sister-in-law said, I want her to have to pay for it. I mean, I don't want her getting off with a lawyer, putting her in a mental institution because this is premeditated mental illness. You don't plan out something, you just act. She planned this out. And I do understand that belief that at the end of the day, she took a gun, she took a knife, and then she brutally slayed two innocent people. So her family are thinking a life for a life. It's as simple as that. Cheyenne's trial began in July 2019, it lasted four weeks. And during a trial, Cheyenne pled not guilty. Honestly, why? Why, Cheyenne? Why did you plead not guilty? So they said that Cheyenne had only confessed to the murders because she was afraid of her boyfriend. Now listen, maybe she was afraid of a boyfriend. Maybe he was a brute. He was certainly not very nice about Meredith. He certainly put some limits on their relationship that put her in a difficult predicament regarding her feelings for him versus her feeling for her daughter. Although, let's be honest, I don't really think she had that many feelings towards her daughter. But nonetheless, he put her in a difficult situation. But the defence, to actually pose a theory that she wasn't involved with the murders at all, Cody did it and she covered up for him because she was afraid of him makes no sense whatsoever. Sorry, so you're saying that she knew he killed her father and daughter. We are, as a defense, we're saying that that's exactly what happened. That she knew that he killed her father and her daughter brutally. And that she was afraid of telling the police that. Because if she told the police that, he would, well, if she told the police that he did it, then he would go to prison for the rest of his natural life, which would make her life less scary. That would seem like a logical, sensible scenario to suppose. But what we're saying is she was so scared of him that she decided not to tell anyone so that he would never get locked up so she could remain scared of him. I hope that she wasn't paying you a lot per hour. Honestly, that's their defense. So yeah, apparently she has only confessed to the murders because she's terrified of her boyfriend and she thought that admitting that she'd killed her father and her daughter would be safer for her than to tell the truth about him doing it. Now the prosecution, however, 
well, I imagine there's something like this. I love these cases. I love these cases. I'm so glad I took it. I'm so glad I took it. Let me dismantle this immediately. In fact, let's just have a round robin. Let's just go out in public and pose what the defence is saying. I just throw a few of the public's arguments into the mix because pretty much all of them will be more sensible than that of what the defence is posing. But the prosecution say, this is rubbish. Cheyenne's boyfriend absolutely was causing issues. He wanted to break up with her because he didn't like the fact that Meredith had these extreme behaviour issues. So she was so desperate to preserve the relationship with her boyfriend that she went ahead and she murdered her daughter and her father. They also argued that it was likely that they were both killed on the 18th of July. They said that Cheyenne knew exactly what she was doing and that she 100% knew that it was wrong. They also said that it could not have been self-defense as at the end of the day, this wouldn't explain the gunshot wounds to the head and the fact that she tried to hide the bodies and tried to clean up the crime scene shows that she knows it was absolutely wrong. Also, deeply incriminating that she used her father's phone to send text messages to literally try to cover up her tracks, showing that she 100% knew exactly what she was doing. And because of that, the prosecution actually sought the death penalty because essentially it was extremely wicked and it was premeditated and therefore it met, as far as they were concerned, the bar for her being put to death. Now, during the trial, Cody, who she was in a relationship with, at the time of the murders, he testified and he actually recounted that he felt quite unnerved by the interest that she had in the decomposition of bodies. He also did say, yes, I was very unhappy in the relationship and the reason I was unhappy was because they had this really tumultuous mother-daughter relationship. He was really negative, I would say, about Meredith. We have to remember she was six years of age when she was actually murdered. So she was literally tiny. And he said that she was somebody who rebelled. I think to use the term rebelled when we're dealing with an under six year old, that's a stretch. That's something that we put into teenage years, absolutely. But under six, often it's symptomatic of something much deeper when they're being defiant, when they're being objectionable. And it tends to be down to very traumatic feelings that they're managing. And this is how it comes out. Particularly if you don't feel loved as a child, you will often be quite rebellious as far as being loud, being behaviorally problematic, or of course, being very isolated within yourself because you're trying to get noticed for this painful experience. So he said that she was very defiant. There was always tension, he said, the way Meredith would scream at her mother they would argue, they would fuss, they would fight. She didn't want to do what her mama told her. She was very disrespectful. She was under six. Cody, what planet are you from? Sorry, it really distresses me when we're talking about language like this being rolled against a child. She was under six. I do appreciate that under six-year-old children can have extreme mood swings and it can be quite terrifying to manage them. It is deeply distressing as a parent to have your child lose control. Of course, we appreciate that. But as a parent, it is your job to offer them a safe space and place where you give them balance, where you acknowledge that they are loved no matter how they are acting, and where once they calm, they understand that nothing has changed. You love them as much now as you did before, and you will tomorrow, and so on and so forth. He also said that Meredith was violent, and that was despite the psychiatric help that she was getting and that even though she was getting the support, her behaviour wasn't changing. No, it probably wasn't because I don't imagine that Meredith was the big issue. I imagine the relationship between her and Cheyenne was. I imagine that she was struggling massively with the fact that she was so disposable for her mother because children pick up on those themes and feelings. Also, it's notable that in the interview, when Cheyenne is being talked to by the police towards when she confesses, she actually starts to talk about the fact that maybe something had happened to her daughter in her early years. Now, part of that would be projection because bad things happen to Cheyenne. That is without a doubt true. But it could also mean that she picks up that something could have happened to her daughter. And I would imagine that what she's suggesting there is either physical or sexual abuse and that this could have played into the way that Meredith is acting 
acting. And of course, if you think about children when they're nonverbal, if they're being physically or sexually abused, they develop a whole heap of behavioral responses to draw you in to understand the pain that they're experiencing. And hopefully loving adults notice that and manage that behavior and accordingly protect them. But it could be that it was that Meredith was failed in early childhood and that she was abused by somebody and Cheyenne has a sense that that happened. Or it could just be that she's supposing that could be a reasoning behind the actual behaviour that her child acted within. But like I said, I can't state that that's an absolute fact. What I do know is having worked with many children who have come from abusive homes, certainly acting out is a form of them managing their trauma. And when they act out, it can be deeply distressing for the more loving people around them because it can seem very extreme. It isn't extreme. It actually comes down to the fact that they often don't have the language or the understanding to describe what's happened to them. And they don't know what's happening to them is wrong, but they just have all of this horror and trauma that plays out within them. And they exhibit that through bad behavior. This often occurs. It's why children who are horribly abused sometimes get labelled as problem children. They're not. They're symptomatic. They're managing the unmanageable as best that they can. He also goes on to testify that Cheyenne actually discussed putting Meredith up for adoption. She hadn't actually seriously pursued it, but she'd suggested that was a consideration. Well, why didn't you, Cheyenne? That would have solved the issue. He also said that apparently Mark, Cheyenne's father, agreed that he would look after Meredith if he received monetary assistance, but that Cheyenne didn't follow up on this offer. I do appreciate that Mark, as a grandparent, would hopefully have taken her in without needing to be paid, but I also think that children are quite expensive, so it would be likely that he'd be saying, well, I'll look after her, but you will have to stump up so much amount of money so that I can feed her and clothe her, etc." Cody also went on to say that the tension between Cheyenne and Meredith really did impact their relationship. And of course, that then supported the argument by the prosecution that the murders were absolutely committed by Cheyenne to actually try to save her relationship with Cody, which is just beyond cold, beyond calculating, and it's despair provoking. It genuinely is that any mother could choose a man like this over the life of her child. Now, during the cross-examination, Cody gets questioned extensively by the defense attorneys, and there were discrepancies, and those discrepancies were pointed out by the defense attorneys because his testimony didn't tally with the information he'd given the investigators. He got pressed quite a lot for specifics and clarification. He got accused by Cheyenne's lawyers of committing the murders himself because obviously they wanted to deflect the actual blame onto him so that there was reasonable doubt, which would lead to the jury finding their particular client not guilty. They actually presented evidence at the trial showing text messages to Matthew, Cody, that is, allegedly from Mark relating to how he was dying of cancer and how he'd taken Meredith to Georgia to live out his days. And what the prosecution said was he wouldn't have sent that to himself. That would be Cheyenne texting him that information so that Cody thought, oh, Mark's left with Meredith. The problem in our relationship is over. And also would give Cheyenne a reason as to why her daughter was no longer present and her father was no longer present. So the prosecution used that in their favour. Now, some of the texts were actually made on July the 22nd. That's several days after the detectives thought that Meredith had actually been killed and the grandfather had been killed. So they are deeply incriminating. And even though the defence is trying to blame Cody, it doesn't make sense that he would be texting himself from the grandfather's phone. It makes sense that it would be Cheyenne doing that. I'm not saying that Cody wasn't aware of what she'd done in the end. There's a strong possibility that he was, but was he involved in the actual murders? I find that highly unlikely from what I've read and understood and researched. When it comes down to how Cheyenne was during most of the trial, she was quite stoic. She kept her head down for most of it. She was slouched and she really didn't show any emotion at any point in the trial. I would say that's one thing that's really interesting about her, even when you hear her being interrogated. One of the things that the police actually say to her constantly is, you're not even crying. We're talking about your child going missing. You haven't shed a tear. They even say, are you dehydrated? Do you need water? Because maybe that will mean that you can start crying. There is just something 
unusual about watching a mother whose child has apparently been taken and whose father has just disappeared with said child who isn't showing any emotion at all, particularly in light of the fact that during that interrogation and interview, they're actually talking about blood being found all over the home. So you would imagine her to be in a state of distress and there is not a tear shed at all. So it's unsurprising that on the 17th of July, 2019, it took the jury less than three hours to find Cheyenne guilty of both the first degree murders of her father and her daughter. She was additionally found guilty of evidence tampering and then there was the penalty phase to decide whether she was going to be put to death. Now, in the penalty phase, in his opening statement, her defence lawyer, Jervis Wise, he said there are many mitigating factors that prevent this from being one of the worst of the worst murder cases that justify a death sentence. Yes, he did say that. He said worst of the worst. So because of the mitigating factors... He felt this wasn't the worst of the worst murder cases. There were worse murder cases that would justify a death penalty, but brutalising, murdering in the most horrific of ways your father and your own daughter, well, that's not the worst of the worst. I mean, with respect, it's not whether I'm pro the death sentence or otherwise, but when it comes down to the worst of the worst type of murders, I think stabbing your own child to death certainly meets that category no matter what mitigating factors you're dealing with, just throwing it in Jervis-wise, I don't necessarily agree with you. I think it's pretty much the worst of the worst when it comes down to it. So Wise said that, basically, Cheyenne's mother had lost custody when she was four years of age because she had been allowing her boyfriends to mistreat her. A witness for the defence, a woman called Martha Faye-Free, she actually testified that Mark, so Cheyenne's father actually said that she had scars from being burned by lit cigarettes in her early childhood so no doubt Cheyenne had a horrific life but he also said that her father said that Cheyenne's mother had allowed her boyfriends to do things to Cheyenne that little girls shouldn't have done so without a doubt it was acknowledged that she was horrifically sexually abused a lawyer then went on to say that expert testimony would demonstrate that she had psychiatric problems and that she also didn't have a normally functioning brain. He said that Cheyenne's family had a history of mental illness, but we can all agree that lots of families have mental illness within it. It doesn't make you brutally murder your child or your father. So essentially, Cheyenne's past issues were considered, and that's right to do. The abuse that she faced in her childhood was brought in. Medical doctors testified that Cheyenne did have significant abnormalities and that they believed that the significant abnormalities would have caused her to have unpredictable and uncontrollable rage and aggression. A psychiatry professor actually told jurors that Cheyenne's mental illness left her unable to control the events that led to the killings of her father and her six-year-old daughter. This guy was called Dr. Joseph Wu. He's a psychiatrist and professor at the University of California. And he actually said, I don't think she was having any clue what was going on at the time. So Wu said that basically severe neglect and mistreatment by her mother when Cheyenne was a toddler left her with significant brain damage, resulting in a full-blown electrical storm in her brain that led to the killings. He said that she was so developmentally delayed when she was young that it's in line with somebody who was clearly severely abused and neglected. Wu actually said, you know, not even able to wipe herself from using the bathroom, not knowing how to use utensils, not being able to have to speak very well. Wu said that neglect and abuse literally resulted in abnormalities in her brain or temporal lobe epilepsy, which he said that under stress led to someone flaring out of control with unpredictable and uncontrollable savage aggression and rage. So he said she has a traumatic brain injury. She was under tremendous stress. This was a perfect storm, a combination of factors resulting in a perfect storm. Now, in spite of that, bear in mind, she had not actually been diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy at the time of the murders. So whilst Wu was cross-examined, this was brought up and prosecutors said, well, okay, you're saying this, but how come 
all of these other mental health professionals missed the epilepsy when they were evaluating she and Jesse throughout the years. And what Wu responded with was that psychologists aren't actually trained to discover this form of epilepsy. Also, Cheyenne Jesse told Wu that before the murders, she was really stressed about an abortion. And she was also very overwhelmed at having to give up her daughter to her father because she wasn't able to basically manage her daughter's behavioral issues. But in spite of that particular expert, when it came down to the closing arguments, the prosecutors said to the jury, listen, when it comes down to it, Shay and Jesse is known to have an average IQ. She was able to maintain several jobs. So if she was such a nightmare mentally, how was she holding all of that down and no one was noticing these issues? It didn't make sense. And even though Wu is an expert, I think that definitely destabilized his testimony. Now, other witnesses did testify that Cheyenne was somebody who apparently cowered under the control of her then boyfriend, Cody. But the prosecution said, hey, listen, if she was cowering under his control, why was her line of choice to go and kill her father and kill her daughter to go and be with him? That doesn't make any sense. If he was such a horrendous person to be around, why carry out the ultimate crime to be with him? That noted, there was another testimony from a witness who said that Shane had actually said that Cody was forcing her to engage in unnatural sex acts and that his parents had apparently told her that she was obligated to do whatever her son had wanted. And if they had done that, that's horrific and unforgivable and totally dysfunctional. But whether that is actually true or not, I can't tell you. All I can say is that was brought up at the trial. Martha Freyfree also actually said that she'd visited Jesse in jail. That was after her arrest in 2015. And she actually said to her at that point that Cody had a new girlfriend. And Cheyenne actually started to cry and said, all this for nothing. So again, that just plays in to exactly what the prosecution believed, that she murdered her daughter and her father to be with Cody. The prosecution, they brought in the victim impact statements from the relatives, from the friends of Mark Weekly, Shan's father. His older brother, Mike Weekly, who came from Indiana, he broke down. He spoke about how much he missed his brother. Longtime friend Kim Hunt actually narrated a slideshow of images showing Meredith as this jolly, smiling little girl with this beautiful long blonde hair. And she described her grandfather as being a generous man who was absolutely devoted to his granddaughter. So really emotional stuff. She also read a statement from her daughter, Amy Hunt, who considered Cheyenne to actually be her best friend. And Amy Hunt lamented just not being able to see Meredith grow up to become what she put down as a fierce woman. And I think that's so powerful, isn't it? It's true. When lives are snuffed out in this way, when children die, they never get to be all the potential they have within them. And it is something to lament. It is something to grieve. Now, when it came down to the actual sentence that she was given, it was decided that she would not be given the death penalty. The judge actually said in this case, it is this court's conclusion that Cheyenne Nicole Jesse should lose her liberty, not her life. He went on to say the circumstances of the capacity of Cheyenne Nicole Jesse to appreciate the criminality of her conduct or to conform her conduct to the requirements of the law was substantially impaired. So basically the judge was saying that Cheyenne was unable to cope with Meredith's emotional and behavioral conditions. Additionally, it turned out that Cheyenne Jesse suffered with major depressive disorders and a number of psychological deficits. So the judge then added that this was another reason why she wasn't going to be put to death because she had this very difficult upbringing. He talked about the fact that she'd faced a lot of abuse in her childhood and also went on to say that around the time of the homicides, the defendant was described as mentally and emotionally unstable and extremely depressed and that she was controlled by her boyfriend. So with that in mind, she was sentenced to two life sentences for the murder. She was also given an additional five years for obstruction of justice instead of the death penalty. So Cheyenne will basically spend the rest of her life behind bars for the murders, but she won't lose her life, which, as I noted, the family hoped she would because they feel that she stole the life of Meredith. She stole the life of Mark 
and essentially therefore she deserved to meet her maker. Again, a lot of people will feel that there are mitigation circumstances. Certainly her childhood was horrible and she was somebody who had many scars because of that. But I draw the line at the suggestion that being abused gives you license to go on to horribly murder people. It's just not the way this plays out in reality. People who are actually sexually or physically abused often turn out to be the most sensitive, loving, compassionate human beings who would do anything to protect the most vulnerable. Now, following the hearing, one of Cheyenne's attorneys actually said that they were satisfied with the sentence. They said, we think the court made a fair and just decision under difficult circumstances. However, the state attorney said they were disappointed. They genuinely thought that Cheyenne deserved the death penalty because they felt that it met the bar for that level of penalty. Of course, what we do know is that she's never going to walk free. She's currently serving a sentence in a Florida women's prison. And I imagine that being a child killer in such a place, well, isn't the most pleasant experience per se. When it comes down to this case, I think what is just so tragic and brutal is there were options. Why did she kill Meredith? Okay, she might have been a problem child regarding her behavior, her emotional outbursts. She may have had many mental health issues. All of this could be true, but there were options. There were places that could have supported her. There were people who could have taken her in. There was an opportunity for that child to grow and be cared for and loved by adults who genuinely had it within their capacity to do so. Instead, it seems that Cheyenne decided that the easier route was to murder both her child and her father and to dispose of them like rubbish. And that is absolutely unforgivable. No matter what your background, no matter what your experience, no matter what your mental health issues, the amount of premeditation and planning that that takes, the willingness to go through with such a heinous crime, that speaks volumes about who you are as a human being. If you can even be noted as a human being. Our wounds from the past do not give us license to carry out such horrific crimes in our future. And as far as I'm concerned, the world is a safer place without Cheyenne walking freely in the streets because people with that cold level of brutality within their nature, they will always be a danger. I'd love to know if you know anything about this case that I haven't put across. For me, your thoughts it is absolutely harrowing, isn't it? We're talking about the most vulnerable of vulnerable children being murdered in the most brutal of ways at the hands of somebody she should have trusted. And it's absolutely abhorrent that these things happen in real life. It's such a shame that Meredith isn't growing up in the care of her grandfather Mark, a man who clearly loved her. And it's a real shame that the excuse of being in love can lead to a reason for murder in the most brutal of fashions. Let me know your thoughts guys. Take care and as ever, be safe.